Well, hello, dear viewers, welcome to Level Up Reviews. This is Wolf. Sorry for such a long hiatus, but I'm back with Ultima 7 Part 2, The Serpent Isles. Let's jam! <laughs> Last time we left Origin Systems, they were forced to join Electronic Arts because of the financial problems. Ultima 7 Serpent Isles is the first Ultima developed by EA-owned Origin. Development had many issues, particularly EA was rushing Origin. You see, EA was mostly used to sports games or shooters, but not RPGs. So, of course, it took far longer time to develop RPGs, but EA expected them to be done as quick as the sports games were. So, game got rushed, and a lot of stuff was cut out of the game. Richard Garriott was the director of the game, alongside with Bill Armintrout, but he wasn't really involved in the game too much. He was already developing Ultima 8 Pagan, we will talk about that much later. Richard actually named it Ultima 7 Part 2, and not Ultima 8, because he did not think there was enough advancements in the technology, and did not want to sell the same game as Ultima 7, as Ultima 8. This is an interesting approach, and if you look at all the Ultimas, there is a huge development in between the games, and I think many developers can learn from it, as opposed to putting out the same game with just changing a number on the title. The game was released in 1993. It came with usual goodies like map and manual. Ultima 7 Part 2 has got a mixed reception, although it did wind up number 13th on 1994's Best Computer Games list, issued by PC Gamer magazine. The game pretty much looks the same and plays the same as Blackgate. There are enough differences in the design though, it has a lot of serpentine-influenced themes to it. Bill Armentor did a good job with this. Music is composed by Dana Carl Glover and Mark Schaefgan. And it's pretty atmospheric and enjoyable. Gameplay is pretty much the same as Ultima 7, so if you're interested in battle system, watch my Ultima 7 review. Though there are a couple of new spells, like Create Automaton, which is a pretty useful spell. You will get four recruitable characters in this game, alongside with the three you already have. Plus, there are four more, but they are just temporary, so... And of course, as usual, best part of the game in Ultima is the setup. Story writers are Raymond Benson and Sherry Hopes. Serpent Isles is a first game in the main series since Ultima 3 that doesn't take place in Britannia. We have been here before, believe it or not. Do you remember when world was called Caesarium? There was one place called Danger and Despair. Shamino ruled there, if you remember. The original inhabitants of this place were called Ophidians, and they worshipped three serpents. Serpent of Chaos, Serpent of Order, and Serpent of Balance. Basically, Exodus in Ultima 3 reaped Serpent of Balance out of Void, which caused war between forces of order and forces of chaos. Eventually, forces of order emerged victorious, but at what cost? Destruction of Ophidian civilization. World building is amazing, as I said. Of course, the game has new, really cool serpentine writing system. I mean, what is Ultima game without new script to torture you? There are three major human settlements populated by exiles from Caesarea. They refuse to conform to new Britannian rule and follow eight virtues and three principles of truth, love and courage. Here they have twisted understanding of them. In Moonshade, you will find mages, who are seemingly dedicating their lives to finding the truth. But in reality, it's highly oppressive society that treats mundanes, non-magic users, like trash. Some people won't even talk to you until you get a spellbook. 
It's almost Nietzschean society, where will to truth is just a mask for will to power. Only the strongest survive, and strongest rule. Found at first glimpse seems normal, a beautiful city. It values beauty over love. This is why everything in this beautiful city is rotten with corruption. And their beloved oracle, who is supposed to judge justly, is just a puppet in the hands of the corrupt government officials. And Montor's courage-obsessed society is ruled by cowards who have no valor. The knights in charge refuse to face goblin forces, and in reality, they're secretly helping them to take over the city. Frankly, a lot of this stuff is so topical. I cannot disagree with Lord British for fighting such dangerous ideology and cleansing Britannia off of them. At the start of the game, you get a cutscene. Apparently, Guardian left a hologram of himself to tell Batlin to go to Serpent Isles. Batlin! In the unlikely event that the Avatar stops me from coming through the Black Gate, I command you to follow the unwitting female human Gweno to the Serpent Isle. Tis my worst fear. I must send the Avatar through the pillars to the Serpent Isle. When you arrive, you will discover something quite awful. A teleport storms that teleport away all of your companions and a lot of your equipment. Well, I guess you gotta find some way to handicap a player. First person you meet in Serpent Isles is Toxia, the monk. She will give you hourglass of fate and tells you to save the world because, of course, it's about to end. First city you arrive to is Montor. After passing a test and eating a wolf stew, uh, yeah, you will become a knight. You also discover that government here is treacherous and lack valor, as I said before. I mean, honestly, it's like every city rooting out corruption just to find out rulers are the corrupt ones. Like in Moonshade, you get rid of Rataluncia, lover of the mage lord. Ew, I do not even want to know what they're into. But. After sleeping with Frigidazi, you find out that she is also a Mage Lord's lover. And after a sham trial, you are sent to Furnace, a prison. Well, there's a positive in here, I guess. You recover your black sword, but Arcadian does not want to obey you anymore. He wants his freedom. Ugh. Which he will get. Granted, after killing Lord Sondo, the mage in here, but. Oh man, this game feels like one big defeat. Now I lose my legendary black sword. I mean, you can restore it to its power, but still, it will never be the same. It's like we're failing every step in this game. Even after you find Batlin, defeat his companions, you will find out that he wants to become stronger than Guardian and become ruler himself. Ritual he performs backfires and releases three creatures, Bane of Insanity, Bane of Anarchy and Bane of Wantingness. They kill Batling and possess your companions. They enact massacre in Serpent Isles. I mean, what did I say about one big defeat? I guess after completing an expansion, Silver Seed Monk Karnax tells you that this will help revive Serpent Isles. Mm, I don't know. I don't really feel like I'm winning anything here. Silver Seed is another one that kind of disappoints me. Compared to Part 1's expansion of Forge of Virtue, basically you need to clear out 4 dungeons and get 4 keys to unlock the room where Silver Seed is kept and then plant it. It turns into a beautiful tree. Somehow it's supposed to help to restore Serpent Isles. Again, as I said, EA rushed them through this game. There is nothing great in here, really. I guess there are two great items in the expansion. One is a magic keyring, where you can keep all of your keys. You will also get a magic ring, which helps you to cast spells without any reagents. 
these two are very useful items. You see, during this game, you will collect a lot of plot critical items. Add to that the money and all the reagents, it's very hard to navigate through your inventory. Honestly, this inventory system is not for this game. You need a better inventory system where you can organize much better. Speaking of Silver Seed, there is a man who tells you that he had a Silver Seed from the tree named Delarian, but it got damaged after he fled his world when Guardian destroyed Elarian. Morgrim is from Pagan, where Ultima 8 will take place, so nice foreshadowing, I guess. There's also a reference to a villain from Ultima 5 Warriors of Destiny, Black Sword, who was actually exiled on Serpent Isles. He wound up in Monastery, and if you will translate one of the journals, you will find out that he changed his life and became a good man. Another demonstration that 8 virtues are good to follow, and compassion and mercy can lead to a great result. And when you pass through the swamp, you will appear into a dream world, where you will meet Lord British and your old friend Smith, the talking horse. For the last time, unfortunately. After usual gig, he starts to say something important, but apparently he wakes up, so he never finishes. Thanks a lot, buddy. Thanks a lot. You will also receive an item called Serpent's Jaw, which will help you teleport into different places so it saves you a lot of traveling time. You will receive this item from a mad mage. Well, if you will help him with his experiment, which is to piece human being back together, you will find a lot of body parts laying around in his island. He's a pretty screwed up human being, let's just say. Oh, there is one more thing. You need serpent's teeth in the jaw. Apparently, mad mage got robbed and a lot of the teeth were lost. You see, each teeth opens up a new teleport location. So, if you want the teleporter to open to each and every location, you will need to collect each and every tooth. Freeing the Banes is pretty cool. I mean, you get to switch bodies with an automaton at some point. Basically, Banes need to be defeated with a black sword, and then trapped into an Easter jam. And after revival of your companions, you need to use water from different wells to make them normal again. Unfortunately though, quest is cut by EA. Yes, another one. Although, I guess denizens of Serpent Isles did learn some lessons after this. Like Feta Biblia the mage, who sacrifices himself to defend his loved ones, showing what is truly important. He was turned to stone, but you can cure him. And Lady Elinda, who is obsessed with her beauty, has her skin removed by Bane of Insanity, hinting in a twisted way that true beauty lies within, not outside. After restoring your companion's sanity, Xenka the Monk tells you that to stop the end of the world, you need to restore Serpent of Chaos. He was killed during the war by Serpent of Balance. For this, you need to do a ceremony, for which you need ashes. Yes, Avatar has to jump into cremation oven alive and sacrifice himself to restore Serpent of Chaos. But your most loyal companion, Sir Dupree, jumps instead of you, completing the ceremony. It is a very touching moment, in all honesty, and Dupree's sacrifice matters a lot here. But one thing that really disappoints me is that characters do not really react to it. A problem I have with this game in general. I mean, I guess Yolo tells you that he is very sad to find out that Gweno is dead, and they have a very heartfelt reunion. Shamino, for example, ignores the fact that in the ruins of his castle, we meet the ghost of his beloved, who is pissed at him for leaving and serving British instead of staying with her. Maybe this part was cut out too? I don't know, it just... I thought they should have elaborated on this one, and Shamino says nothing. And I feel like there is some character growth missed in here. 
Finally, you go to Sunrise Isles, where you need to solve a lot of puzzles. Yes, there are a lot of puzzles in Serpent Isles, not as much as it's gonna be in the future games, but still. So, basically, you put a bunch of items on the pedestals, don your serpent attire, and restore all serpents. There, we are done. Balance is restored. Serpent Isle, Britannia, your Earth. The entire universe, all are saved. Worry not about your friend Dupree. He is one with us and content. Goodbye, Avatar. We thank you. However, this is not gonna be a triumphant victory. Guardian appears and kidnaps you. Perhaps you would join me on another world altogether. We do have a score to settle. Ultima 7 Part 2 Serpent Isles feels like one big defeat. In an attempt to save the world, you wind up watching cities massacred by your own companions. Your most loyal companion dies in a horrible way and is bound into a chaos serpent. And Avatar winds up kidnapped by a guardian. Seemingly, all of these issues should condemn this game to be terrible, or at least bad. However, all of the development issues aside, the game is brilliant. After I finished playing this game, I got a little bit depressed. And to get such feelings from the game that was so severely undercut and restrained is an achievement of its own. Sometimes I wonder if the developers put their own frustration within this game, feeling of dread that their creation would not live up to name of Ultima Games. But funnily enough, that is the reason why it lives up to the name of Ultima. It leaves you with mixed feelings and deeper thought. Well, it looks like we're about to save another world or perhaps doom it. If you like my video, please like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to leave a comment. Thank you very much.